Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. We've covered a variety of subjects over the last few months, especially the, the nature of God, and I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the church. We hear a lot of various things about the church today. We hear from the LDS that the splintered nature of the church, especially here in America, is, an, ex uh, is a, an evidence that there is something fundamentally wrong, that the restoration was needed because reformation wouldn't work. Uh, we see the same complaint basically made by Roman Catholics that they believe that the church was one and holy and Catholic and then along came the Protestant reformers and turned everything upside down. I hope to, sit, to show you over the next few weeks that these are distortions of the reality that the church has been corrupted by wicked men. She has been attacked. She has been counterfeited. But God has preserved his church and that there's none that can pluck his saints from his hand and the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Before I begin with an explanation of the uh, deformation of the church, how the church was taken away from what it was intended to be, and how the church needs to be reformed, how it has been reformed and needs to be reformed again. I want to focus this evening on just the importance of the church. This is something that I've touched on in past episodes, and yet it is something that it never ceases to amaze me the contempt that people have for the visible church of Jesus Christ. In the first epistle of Paul to uh, Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he describes there what I believe to be the, the main focus of that whole epistle. He says there, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know, uh, know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. There is such contempt among modern evangelicals for the institution of the church. This is not universal, but it is an overwhelming contempt, and we've touched on it but I want to flesh it out, and I want to hold that contempt up to the light of Scripture. What does Scripture say about the visible church? The Apostle Paul here is dealing with a young pastor who is trying to, to ground people in the truth and also to counteract heresies and errors within the church. People who have come in who are trying to lead people away after them and, and trying to uh, tell people that what Paul has been teaching is not the real truth and that they need to be following them and be uh, more enlightened and more spiritual. These counterfeits go back, through, uh, back to the earliest days of man, as we'll see when we go through this next week. But one of the things that frustrates me is that especially here in Utah, there seems to be either an, either an outright outspoken 
contempt for the church or one that may not be verbalized but is just as contemptuous in its implications. What passes as evangelism all too often in Utah um, uh, to the, to the Latter-day Saints is to tell them that they don't need a church, all they need is Jesus. And we, have, we hear it among people who are former Mormons who uh, don't want to be answerable to any church anywhere. They feel they've been burned and therefore all churches are suspect. I had uh, one prominent evangelical leader tell me one time that churches were only meant to abuse people. That's not the picture that's given in the scriptures. The picture that is given in the scriptures is that the ch church is important. Not just in a, a vague, fuzzy, spiritual way. That the church is only this invisible entity, uh, a, a term that's used as an umbrella to cover all the people who are truly saved. But the church as an institution. In the epistle, of 1 Timothy, Paul goes through a host of different things stressing holiness, stressing propriety. What kind of elders are you supposed to have? What kind of deacons are you supposed to have? How is it that men are to pray? How is it that women are to behave themselves in the church? This isn't just some vague spirituality. He's talking about a visible institution, a visible covenant community. And the emphasis here is on why these things matter. The importance is that they should know how to, they ought to conduct themselves in the house of God. The church is the house of God. It is equivalent to the tabernacle and to the temple. Those are the terms that are used in the Old Testament to describe the, uh, the, the place where the people met with God, the place where there was that special presence, where there was that whole, the Holy of Holies, where the Shekinah glory was. That house of God, the tabernacle which gives way to the temple, that was the place where God uniquely was. And that's what the church is called. The church is referred to here as the house of God, and it's also referred to by Paul in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 19 and following. He says there, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom all you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And then Peter also uses in 1 Peter 2 similar language about how we're living stones in this new temple. Now there is a sense in which the household of God, we are a family. But it's also that we are the temple. And this is something that is clearly taught repeatedly as I just showed you. The church as an institution is the house of God. Now remember, this is the God whom the heavens of heavens cannot contain. And yet, we as individuals become the temple of God but also as members of his mystical body. We're knit together in him. We're knit together as living stones. We're knit together as a body. Jesus Christ being the head or the chief cornerstone. We need to recognize how important the church is. I hear from a lot of home church people. They come out of an instant, often they come out of a church that is not a biblical church. Uh, they don't have membership. They don't have accountability. They don't have discipline. And those situations all too often lend themselves to dictators, pretending them to be pastors. There's no check and balance of, of authority. There's no accountability for the pastor. And they get burned. And then 
they respond against it by arguing against the institutional church. And I am amazed at how many people, it seems they want to spit when they, when they talk about the church as an institution. This is a hyper-pietistic uh, dream to have the church not be a visible institution. Yes, there are people who are members of the visible church who are not, who are not converted, who are, who are playing games with God, for whom religion is a dodge, it's, a, it's a, an evasion. But we need to recognize that membership in the, visible, in the invisible church, very clearly in the, in the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, was a sub, uh, was a, they were a subset, true believers were a subset of the visible church. How did you know whether someone was a Christian or not? It wasn't simply just a matter of a profession of faith. When people were baptized, they were baptized into a visible covenant community. They knew who their elders were. They knew who their brothers and sisters were. When they were told to bear one another's burdens, it wasn't left up to them to define for themselves. They knew who their, who their brothers and sisters were. But in our frustration with the, um, the, the dictators who pretend to be pastors, the, in our frustration with so many other things, there's been a temptation to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And we see it manifested in a whole host of ways. Uh, the, the, the most extreme example, of course, is Harold Camping, who says that the, the church age is over, that to attend the public worship of God with other Christians is something that is uh, damnable, that this is um, something that is a, a high place, an, an idolatrous worship. I won't, I won't run down that rabbit trail. But we hear people with the same kind of contempt, sometimes even from within evangelical circles. The church as an institution is a covenant community where there are members who are accountable to one another. There are elders within the church. Elders are very clearly laid out here in 1 Timothy. They're laid out elsewhere, where Paul appoints elders in every city. Well, to whom were those elders accountable for pastoring them? Who was accountable to submit to those elders as they were commanded in places like Hebrews 13, 17? We don't hear those answers very often. People, they say, you know, we should just have a fellowship. Let's not... Let's not have a church and all this formal membership and things like this. Let's just have a fellowship. But that's not what you see in the Bible. What you see in the Bible is that when your brother sins against you, there is a visible church that he is supposed to hear. You remember what Jesus says in Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, then you go individually to your brother with the hope that you'll regain your brother. You don't publicize his sin. You don't go out and try to slander him and build uh, some kind of coalition against him. You have the obligation, if your brother sins against you, you have to go to your brother and show him his sin and seek to be reconciled to him. If he doesn't hear you, then you take back witnesses so that everything can be established. If still he doesn't turn, then you tell it to the church. And if he doesn't hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. The question I've got for all the, the, the house church people, the fellowship people, and everybody else out there, what church? Who do you have to listen to? There is membership because we are in covenant with one another. 
The alternative that I have seen all too often is people pick and choose who they want to be accountable to. And if they, if they get into trouble with one group of people, then they turn to another group of people and they try to play that against the others. And there's no real accountability. We had someone who used to come to, to our local congregation. He was not a member. Didn't believe in church membership, but he assured me that he would submit to me as a pastor. I tried to work with him and be patient in that. He never would submit himself. When we had some problems, I talked to him. He didn't like what I said, and so he became party to public slander. When I wrote to him and said, what is it that I've done? Please show me. He cited something that wasn't scriptural. And I said, uh, this is contrary to our book of church, or church order, but if you can show me from the scriptures where I have sinned, I'll gladly repent. His response was, well, since you are now unrepentant, I now publicly declare you a heathen. By what, by, by what right? By what authority do you declare as an individual other people to be heathen? To be no Christian at all? That's the, that's the work of a pope. And that's what we end up with is people functioning as popes. They are a wall to themselves. They, they don't submit to anyone. They're not in community where there's real accountability. There's not, there, there's no uh, check on their authority. Instead, people end up making unilateral decisions and then they go out and seek others to, to join them in their denunciations of others. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The reason for that is that the church is the household of God. It is the house of God. It is the church of the living God. In Acts 20, Paul is warning the Ephesian elders about why it's important for them to be good shepherds of the flock. He warns them that there are wolves that are coming. Wolves who are going to come in and attack the flock. They're going to rise up from their own number, men speaking perverse things and trying to lead the people away. And he emphasizes the importance of them being faithful shepherds, guarding the flock, teaching them the truth, and standing against error when he tells them that to, they are to remember that this is the church that God purchased with his own blood. Why is it important to study the doctrine of the church? Because of whose church this is. It's important to understand how the church has been counterfeited, how it has been corrupted through men's traditions, whether with the Pharisees or the Roman Catholics or even today. The Pharisees, you remember, they corrupted things through their traditions. They taught the commandments of men as, as, as if they were from God. And Jesus condemned them for that. They were supposed to go back to the scriptures and reform. We see the same thing in the Protestant Reformation. We need the same thing today to go back to the scriptures and to hold all things to the line of God's word. Why, why do we bother? Because of the importance of the church. It is the household of God. It's the church of the living God. And it is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now that sounds very strange for some Protestants to think that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. But think about it. What is the witness that is looked to by the world? What, how does the world judge the claims of Jesus Christ? Does the world go out and read the Bible for itself generally? No. They look to the church. And the reason that Paul was emphasizing in 1 Timothy the conduct within the church 
that, that women are not to teach men. They're not to exercise authority over them. The reason that there are to be elders who, who are sober, who are, who are godly men, that they are apt to teach, have all these qualities. Why is it important to have, have solid, godly men in the church? Because we are the pillar and ground of the truth. We stand as a witness before a watching world. And I think the imagery there is very similar to what you see in the book of Revelation, where there's a danger of the church having its lampstand removed because it has corrupted itself, because it has compromised with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And just like with the Jews of old, the visible people of God become a stumbling block. Instead of bringing honor to his name, we become the reason that his name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. The Jews were supposed to be a holy people. They were supposed to be that example before the watching world. And yet it was because of their sinfulness, their compromise, their worldliness, their infidelity, that the, God of, the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles. Look at us today. Now, unbelievers are never going to really love Christians. They nailed Jesus to a cross, the incarnation of love. They're going to, uh, they're going to continue doing the same thing to his disciples until his return. At the same time, Jesus himself said that men are to be able to see our good works so that they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. We are to be that city set on a hill, a light shining in the darkness. We are to be that salt that prevents the decay around us. And so the church, as a visible people of God, is important. We are the pillar and ground of the truth. Not just in some mystical way, but in, a, in, a, in an objective way. I'm going to flesh that out, but I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines. We're talking about the church, specifically the visible church. Is it important? And if so, why? When Latter-day Saints see that they have a visible church, they have a call to holiness, they have, they have leaders who bear the titles of leaders in the scriptures, and they look at many of their critics who deny these things, how are they expected to take us seriously about other things? These people who say that the church is only a means to abuse people, the church is optional, that the church is not really visible, the church is just a spiritual thing. How do we answer that? The phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. What, what is the visible church supposed to be? Is there supposed to be a visible church? What do we make of people who separate themselves from the visible church? I invite you to call in and, and join in the conversation. Well, let's look at that. One of the things that has amazed me over the years here in Utah is how many people, they come into the church with all kinds of excitement. They come in, they, they have come out of Mormonism or they've come out of um, drugs, alcohol. They've come from uh, churches where it seems as if things have been watered down and sweetened up. They come to us and they come with excitement. If they're coming from an evangelical church, uh, we tell them to pursue reform there before they come to us. Uh, that they need to exhaust those means and to do so in love and gentleness, meekness, uh, before they think about leaving membership in another visible church that, that's 
evangelical. But they come in, and it seems like everyone's very happy for a while, but then something happens. And we have people who want to leave. Now, sometimes there are people who want to leave uh, to go to another church. That's actually been a very rare occurrence. Most people, when they decide to leave for whatever reasons, I, I, not God, I can't judge their hearts, they say they don't want to go to another church. They simply want to have their name erased from the rolls of our congregation. What does that mean? To have your name erased from the rolls of a church? There are many people because of what they've seen on the LDS side who seem to think that membership in the church is, is like membership in a country club. And that this is just where I'm, I'm working within this structure for a while, but then I can withdraw and, you know, maybe I'll go join a vis another visible church somewhere or maybe I won't. It's no big deal. Well, let me ask you this. According to what you see in the New Testament, how did you know someone was a Christian? Was it enough to, be, to, to make a profession of faith? No. You had to also be baptized. And when you were baptized, you were baptized into a church with very clear membership, very clear uh, authority, and there was discipline within that church. When, um, when the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 5, have a man who has married his father's wife, what does Paul tell them to do? Put the evildoer out from among you. And he talks about how he has told them not to eat with all of these ungodly people and to have nothing to do with them. But then he has to qualify what he means by that. He says, he's not saying with all the ungodly people everywhere because you'd have to come out of the world. The line he is drawing there in 1 Corinthians 5 is that they are not to eat with one who claims to be a Christian and yet is in a rebellion against God who, is, who will not listen to the church. They have been put out. When, when uh, Jesus says, if they will not hear the church, let them be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Do you recognize a heathen and a tax collector as a brother in Christ? No. Is our judgment as the church perfect, infallible? No, it's not. We may make mistakes. And God, God may be the one who has to correct them. We do have a series of checks and balances. We have a plurality of elders who have been voted on from within the congregation we have a clear statement of faith and a clear statement of practice. We're not allowed to violate those. If someone believes that we are in error, the local elders are accountable to the presbytery, to the larger church. And so you can appeal from the local congregation to the regional church, to the, to the presbytery where there are representatives from all the local churches who come together and, and sit together as a court of the church. If the Presbytery is not able to settle something to everyone's uh, uh, satisfaction, then we can also appeal to the General Assembly where there are representatives from all the Presbyteries that, are, that have come together. Are the, church of the court, are the courts of the church perfect? No. But are they very good? Yes. We are to submit to one another. We are to hear the church. The way that people in the old, excuse me, in the New Testament were recognized as brothers and sisters in Christ is they were members of the church. Those who were outside, those who would splinter the church, divisive people like uh, Titus 3.10, you warned them twice, then you have nothing more to do with them. But it seems to be this common attitude among evangelicals here in Utah, and it's not just here, but it's, this is where I've been for the last 12 years. This is where I've seen it in a degree I never imagined elsewhere. 
people get frustrated and they don't they don't say to themselves you know I think that I would fit better at a Baptist church if someone came to us and said uh, we want to move our membership to First Baptist Church of wherever because we are and we would ask them why and if it's because they have become convinced of, of um, credo baptism versus pedo baptism then we would ask them well then let's sit down and, and discuss these issues and, sit, and try to be good Bereans and search these things out uh, we, we ask you to sit and, and hear us before you make that kind of decision. If after they have carefully considered everything that we have to say, they're still unconvinced, then they can go to another, you know, they can go to a Baptist church uh, and we will give them a letter of standing so that they can be received and it's clear that they're a member in good standing. We would wish them well and we would recognize a good Baptist church as a, as, a, as a valid church, even though we would disagree with them on uh, a number of areas of doctrine. A good Baptist church, we're going to agree about who is God, who is man, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, what is salvation. We'll agree on those things. If someone wants to leave the church and go to join the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we, we would not work with them on that. that we believe that that would be a, a renunciation of the faith. Uh, if they wanted to go join the Jehovah's Witnesses, we wouldn't work with them on that. But if they wanted to go join another evangelical church, we would work with them. What I am amazed at is how few people seem to care enough to try to move to any other church. People tend to view the church as optional, that they can leave the church and sit at home, and it doesn't matter. Paul tells the Hebrews that they are not to forsake the assembling together of themselves, as has been the, 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 the practice of some. Now, taken out of context, that can, that can seem like just a, a mild encouragement that we need to be worshiping with our brothers and sisters on the Lord's Day. But remember the context of the book of Hebrews. These people are being persecuted, not yet to the point of death, but soon they will be. Nero has declared war against Christianity. He has blamed the Christians for burning Rome. Very soon, it will be a death sentence to be a Christian. So what's going to be the temptation? The temptation is not to go and join with the visible people of God on the Lord's Day in worship because what happens if you, if you get discovered? You start gathering with other people, you're going to be suspicious. Your neighbors may recognize that this is a Christian gathering and betray you all. And then again, there are going to be people who to save their own lives and the lives of their children, they may betray you. And there's all kinds of rationalizations that you can imagine went through these people's minds about why they shouldn't bother to attend worship in the assembly of the saints. And yet they are commanded by the apostle of the Lord. They are commanded by God himself not to forsake the assembling together of themselves. There are people who have uh, legitimate reasons. I don't, I'm not the master of anyone's conscience. I can't bind people's conscience about uh, whether their cold or flu or headache or whatever is uh, a valid excuse to be out of worship. I mean, if, you're, if you have a communicable disease, please don't come and share. But I hear people who want to make excuses for never coming to worship, who don't think worship is really that important. It's not really that important to come and worship as the body of Christ. It's not important to be in community and really work towards fellowship with other people. 
the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians that this is madness. It's like a hand going off by itself, receiving no nourishment from the body, no support, and saying, I don't need the body. It's like an, a, a, a dismembered eye plucked out from the body and put off by itself. That's what we're like when we think we don't need to be in community, in fellowship, in covenant with God's people. Back in the third century, Cyprian was one of the church fathers in North Africa. And he was so bold to say, he cannot have God as his father who has not who does not have the church as his mother. And that sounds like something Roman Catholic to many people. He's the one who also said, extra ecclesium nullo salus, uh, which is the Latin for that outside of the church there is no salvation. Now if that sounds like that's only, I mean, if, if you think that that's only Roman Catholic, you need to recognize that the Westminster Confession of Faith, which rejects the Pope as an antichrist, says there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof. But then it goes on to say that the visible church is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Can someone like the uh, in the story of um, uh, my mind just went the the man who was shipwrecked uh, for so many years uh, it was based on the Scotsman um, Daniel Defoe uh, this is the danger of live television but can a man off on a desert island with the Bible come to a saving knowledge of Christ of course is he outside of the visible church? Yes. Does that mean he's not a Christian? No. But what do we make of people who say they are Christians and refuse to obey Christ? They refuse to submit to their brothers and sisters. They don't hear the church because they don't recognize any church as having any authority over them. Matthew 18, how do you follow that if you're not a member of a visible covenant community? If they don't hear the church, let them be to as a heathen and a tax collector. If they are rebellious and will not submit to legitimate authority, how is it that elders are supposed to have legitimate authority. Well, God appoints elders. God says that there are to be men who rule in the church. There are men, they have to rule their own homes well. They rule in the church. Now at the same time, they're given plenty of warnings, especially by uh, Peter, about not warding themselves over the people. They are to be, the greatest among them is to be the servant of all. There, there's a balance there. They are to be godly men so that people can submit to them willingly. But the people have to submit. We have three basic covenant structures that God has appointed. The family, the church, and the state. To me, the appeals to to do away with uh, formal vows and, and covenants within the church echoes of the attempts to get rid of the visible covenant of marriage back in the 60s and 70s. People, you know, you go back and uh, listen to some of the songs about uh, not needing ink on a page, not needing uh, all these trappings. All we need is love. What really matters is that people love one another. That's what's going to hold us together. And they did away with marriage as an institution. And what did it bring? It brought chaos. And it brought heartache and tragedy. 
does the visible institution of marriage ensure love? No. Does it create love? No. But the visible institution of marriage takes two people who are sinners who do love each other and it helps to maintain that love and it helps to provide channels for resolutions of conflicts. It reminds them that God is the one who ordained marriage and there's, there's a party in their covenant beyond themselves. What does a wife do when her husband doesn't seem trustworthy? When he doesn't seem worthy of submission? She can't trust that he's going to act in her best interest. She thinks he's selfish. She thinks he's foolish. How, does she, how can she submit to him? Because she remembers that God is also there and he's commanded her to. How is it that a husband is supposed to lay down his life for his wife to love his wife as Christ loved the church, even when she's not lovable, even when she seems ungrateful, when she seems not to submit, but to try to rule over him, when she tries uh, to, to undermine, when she seems to dishonor rather than to honor him, how does he do what he's supposed to do? He remembers there's another, uh, another party in that covenant. God appointed marriage. He's the one who created the whole institution. He's the one who creates the covenant and brings them together. In the state, you can refuse to recognize that you're under any legitimate authority. But God has a dim view of that. Some, just like some people tried to go super spiritual on marriage, some people try to go super spiritual on the state. The king that we're to pray for that Paul says to honor the king and to, you know, to pray for governing authorities and do these things, was most likely Nero, the one who cuts off Paul's head. But Paul is the one who says to submit to the governing authorities, to rebel against the governing authorities is to be in rebellion against God. Does that mean that we follow them when they try to make a sin? No. Does it mean that tyrants have to be obeyed no matter what? No. But when the state tells us to pay taxes, we have to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It's not optional. God has appointed a, the visible institution of the state, and there is a mission. There is accountability within it. It becomes very ridiculous when we see people try to say, you know, I'm so spiritual, I don't need the state. I'm so spiritual, I don't need marriage. And yet somehow or another we let it slide when they say, I'm so spiritual, I don't need the church. We are called to bear one another's burdens. We're told a cord of three strands is not easily broken. What's the problem with a hand going off on its own? The hand isn't fed. It, can't, it, it, it dies. It withers. It, it cannot sustain itself on its own. Not only does it hurt the hand, it hurts the body for the hand to be detached from it. And so over and over and over we are commanded to love one another. And to love not just in word, but in deed. What does it say when people refuse to love their brothers and sisters in Christ and to be accountable? I know no other conclusion than that they are not Christians. When people remove themselves from the visible church, this is something that's not generally taught, and there are people who have ask for their names to be erased without realizing, I think, the importance of it. But think about it. I want to open up the phone lines one more time. If you'd like to join in the conversation, phone number here, 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. How, how do we know with whom we eat? 1 Corinthians 5. Who, how do we know whom we receive as a brother? Anyone who tells us they are? 
It strikes me as, as ridiculous that many times the people who are the, the greatest foes of Mormonism have no understanding of the importance of the visible church. As I said, I've had one, one evangelical leader who, who said the church was a means of abusing people. I asked, I said, well, how do you deal with someone who sins against you? How do you deal with someone who um, say, I said, you know, they, they didn't like uh, going down that you know, church discipline road. So I, I backed up. I said, okay, how about this? You've got a fellow who is a professing Christian. He abandons his wife and children and is shacking up with, with another woman. And yet he still wants to be recognized as a brother in the Lord. And he's unrepentant. And the answer I got was, you receive him. I was, I was told, you just receive him, no matter what, you just receive him. And he knew my next question, and I, I said, well, what about if he's, I started to say, what if he's homosexual? So just receive him too. Just, I'm, I'm not in the place to judge people. And yet it was someone who was an outspoken critic of Mormonism, I said, and I didn't get that. 1 Corinthians 6 says adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, a whole host of other drunks, people who are living in sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. They are not Christians. They demonstrate that. They are, they're not people who fall into sin and get up and, and uh, in repentance and, and walk away from it, or even better yet, run away from it. Instead, they fall into sin and they wallow in it. How do we know who a Christian is? Well, we have no, we have no magic glasses. We have no crystal ball. People may claim that they get some special um, testimony of the Holy Spirit. But God gives us an, an objective standard that at least gives us a framework. Are they in the visible church? Are they, are they submitting themselves? Are they coming to worship? Are they, are they hearing the church? Are they submitting to, to, the, to the elders of the church? Is that, is that a perfect determiner? No. Can there be false brothers? Yes. But the invisible church is almost always a subset of the visible. That's why it's so important to focus on how the church as a visible institution has been corrupted and how it needs to be reformed and how we are called to live here and now. Unless we recover the doctrine of the church, I really think that we are doomed as, as the church in this country. If we embrace this, this popular idea of California Christianity that all we're supposed to do is fellowship together uh, in some loose-knit way where there's no accountability, where uh, we go and we listen to this preacher this day and this preacher this day, and we, we're looking for someone to, to entertain us, to, to, to maybe make us feel that we're being educated. I mean, that sounds like the people who are, who are heaping up to themselves teachers to satisfy their itching ears. What is a pastor supposed to do? Pastor means shepherd. He is to feed the flock. He is to teach them. The Apostle Paul can say to the Ephesian elders in, in Acts 20 that he is free from the blood of all men because he has not shunned to declare to them the whole counsel of God. The picture there is that, like the watchman in Ezekiel, if he did not declare 
what the Lord was doing, that he would be guilty of their blood. He would, uh, they would have their own guilt for what they had done, but their blood would be required at his hands. So he declares the whole counsel of God. Not just the little you know, pieces to get you in the kingdom. He proclaims everything. Jesus didn't say to go out and make converts. He said to, to, to make disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There is a ministry of teaching, preaching the word, ministering it individually. But also, what, is, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd helps defend the flock against wolves. The shepherd keeps the flock together. When we cater to the consumer mentality that pervades our culture, when we try to make the church into a consumer item, and so we get rid of membership, we don't have vows, we don't have a covenantal view of our relationship, we end up with nothing. We end up with a bunch of self-absorbed consumers who do not tremble at God's Word, who aren't put into community with real people who, who try their patience and are the means of God's sanctifying them. Think about marriage. Marriage is something that many people have this idyllic view. They're, they're going to get married and everything's going to be wonderful. They're going to ride off into the sunset together. Well, for Christians, hopefully, when, they're, you know, when they get past the, the, the rose-colored glasses stage and they realize that they're married to a sinner and so is their spouse, that interaction with someone who is a sinner becomes a means of their sanctification. It, it teaches them to be humble. It teaches them to be patient and kind to remember the mercy that they've been shown so that they can show it to others. That's what's supposed to happen in the church as well. There are no perfect marriages. There are also no perfect churches. But God uses this to strengthen us, to, to, to sanctify us. And it is a rarity. So in the following weeks, we're going to be talking about how the church that is supposed to be the, the, the household of God, the church of the living God, the church purchased with God's own blood, the pillar and ground of the truth, how does it go from these wonderful things to being what we see in its corrupted form? When we look around the church today and we see that it is characterized by apostasy and compromise when we see the president of the National Association of Evangelicals turn out to be uh, a drug abuser and a sodomite. Do we simply throw up our hands with so many and say, oh well, the church age is over or the church age is about to be over and the sooner the church goes down the tubes, the better. That just means Jesus is going to come and rapture us all away. No. I hope that we're going to see that the church has always been in the midst of sanctification. That there have also always been counterfeits. There have always been divisions. And that when we look around and we see these things in our day, it's not something that should shock us as if it's, as if it's something strange. Sometimes people have and too high an expectation of what the church is supposed to look like in this world. And so they look around and they say, look, they're Baptists, they're Presbyterians, there's Episcopalians and Lutherans, there are all these different groups. Obviously, there's something fundamentally wrong in our day. And it has to be resolved. We should work to resolve it. We should take these things seriously. They should be a scandal to us. And yet at the same time, we need to recognize what God's Word says about these things. And it's not as if 
somehow or another the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn and now we're only, only now are we having problems. The church has always been under assault and the church has always been challenged by the sinfulness of its own members. We are sinners who have been justified when we have been brought to faith in Jesus Christ. And yet Hebrews 10, though we are perfect in Christ, we are still being sanctified, being freed from the power of sin as we've already been freed from its guilt. So we invite you to tune in next week and we will be going through some of these things. I want to invite you, if you were down in the Utah County area or if you're close by, uh, maybe down in the Draper, Southern uh, Salt Lake County area, we are starting a study of the faith this Sunday at 4.30 p.m. It's going to be in the Senior Center in American Fork. If you'd like more information, uh, you can give us a call at 801-969-7948. Uh, we hope to eventually see a church plant uh, down there in Utah County. We're going to be going through uh, the Bible in a systematic way. We're going to start with the scriptures. And we invite you, even if you're not interested in being part of a church plan, if you're LDS and have questions about why do we believe the Bible to be true? Why do we believe that uh, the canon of Scripture has been closed, even when we know the LDS argument's contrary? We invite you to come. We're going to be discussing the authority of the Bible. That's going to be chapter one. We're going to spend several weeks on it and hope you can come and join us. Our congregation here in Salt Lake meets Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. We have Sunday school at 9.30. We're going through a similar study here. Uh, we meet at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna here in the Salt Lake Valley. We have a sister congregation in Ogden, Berean Presbyterian Church. They meet at 3350 Harrison Boulevard at 9.30 a.m. invite you to worship there as well. We are churches that are part of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We believe the Bible is our only infallible rule of faith and practice. We believe we are sinners saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. We believe we stand for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And we invite you to join with us soon. Until next week, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night.